is uh, Dr. Marie Baja and Dr. Diane Howard, our presenters. Uh, Dr. Marie Baja is the Associate Professor from the Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics uh, here at University of Texas at Austin. And Dr. Diane Howard is a non-resident scholar here at UT Austin Strauss Center for International and Security Studies and adjunct professor in the School of Law. So thank you. All right. Well, thank, uh, thank all of you very much. And um, yeah, I guess we're, we'll just kind of stand and do this together. Kind sure. Of? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I love laptops. Yeah, yeah. We're just going to set up something here, a website that's going to make what we have to say more meaningful. So just bear with us. How's everybody doing today? Awesome? Yeah. All right. All right. And, uh, there you go, sir. Thank you so much. This is how easy it is for all of you to find this site. There you go. All right, well, this will take however long it takes given the uh, internet connectivity. Um, let's see, everybody, everybody can hear me well here. Is there a, do we want like separate microphones or do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that because I think the ability to kind of walk around is going to make a lot of sense. With us two just stuck here at the podium, it's going to make things a little bit more awkward, maybe. Ah. All right, perfect. Thanks so much. What was that? We're sure this has internet connectivity? Yeah, we got okay. it. Okay. All right. So my name is Morabaja. I am associate professor here in aerospace engineering. I am an astrodynamicist. Anybody here watch the movie The Martian? All right. So that guy, Rich Purnell, plays in The Martian. That's me. I mean... Maybe you know, I'm better looking than Rich Purnell, but we won't talk about that too much here. So as an astrodynamicist, it is my job to study and predict the motion of objects in space. That's what I do. And interestingly enough, I wonder how many people in this room actually know that we only currently track about 1% of objects hazardous to critical space services and capabilities that we depend on. Anybody here know? Okay, right, very good, I, I see a few of you. So hazardous to what sorts of things? Well, in general, you know, we have space services that look down on Earth that provide information about weather warnings, information on banking, these sorts of things, but for the DOD, think MILSATCOM, think DSP, think a number of other objects that I probably can't or should not mention in this room, right, providing critical service and capabilities. And there are roughly about half a million, half a million objects currently orbiting the Earth that could pose a hazard to the services that these satellites provide. Everything ranging, and when I say half a million objects, I mean things ranging in size from a speck of paint all the way up to a school bus, okay? A speck of paint traveling at the right speeds, colliding with one of these objects could render it useless. But we can't track things as small as a speck of paint. We can only track things as small as, say, a smartphone. So when we limit ourselves in size to things from a softball or, or smartphone in size all the way to the school bus, out of that half a million things, that means we can only track about 26,000 things, okay? And of those 26,000 things, only about 2,000 actually work. Everything else is garbage. That's a lot of garbage. Now, within the 26,000 things, 
there's most of it is debris and I would say from a DOD perspective the question is debris or not debris that is the question but um okay humor is a little bit uh, there's there's inertia in the room all right so many things that could be not hazardous but actual threats to these services could be hiding in that population in that clutter so when I say hazard and threat, what do I mean? Well, when I was quite, quite young, uh, I was a cop in the Air Force. I was a security policeman guarding nukes at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. I'll tell you that nothing motivates a youngster to go to college as being a cop at a missile base. So um, <clears throat> a threat required three things to exist at the same time. Intent, opportunity, and capability to cause harm, right? And so I'm, I'm calling a hazard something that lacks the intent, but still has the capability and the opportunity to cause harm. So the thing is, we really want to be able to predict both hazards and threats to any of these services and capabilities because at the end of the day, I heard the opening speech, it's all about the soldier and what is the soldier able to do or not do? What could impede the soldier's mission? And some of these services are critical to the soldier's ability to actually accomplish that mission. So these are the things I'm talking about. There's, there's stuff that's, that potentially could be hiding there that could be masked, and we need to really understand those things. One of the other things that makes the space environment a little bit worse is that most of what we put in orbit never comes back. Yeah, so we have a satellite, we put it in orbit, it runs out of fuel, and we just send up something else. And then we send up something else, and then something else. And every once in a while, two of these things will collide with each other, or one of these things will explode, or even worse, one of these things may be intentionally destroyed by somebody, hint, hint, and this creates many, many more things also most of which may never come back either. Now, these things aren't just scattered randomly in space. It turns out that given the nature of space-time, the curvature of space-time itself, there are ideal locations where we put things. There's this kind of region, call, them a, call it space highway. One of these space highways is called Sun Synchronous. Another one of these space highways is called uh, Mid-Earth orbits where we put global navigation satellite systems like GPS. Another one of these highways is called geostationary because the time it takes for a satellite to go once around its orbit is equivalent to an Earth day. That way you don't have to be constantly pointing your direct TV dish. It's satellites usually in the same kind of location in the sky. And the thing about these highways is that much like highways on Earth, these highways can only take up to a certain capacity of traffic in order to maintain safe operations, okay? And again, most of this stuff never comes back. Unlike highways on Earth, there are no space traffic rules. None! So, put something on orbit, you get to operate it any which way you see fit. Ah! Imagine getting on the road in your car and there's no traffic rules. Everybody just gets to do whatever they want. There's no standard of behavior on, on orbit. What could possibly go wrong with this? So, imagine, imagine if we had something like a ways for space, a space traffic map that you could see everything on orbit and predict what the space traffic is going to be today, maybe even next week. And imagine if this open, transparent capability, this space traffic map could also be used to build a body of evidence of activity and behavior that could then inform policy and regulation. That makes sense, right? And imagine if this could provide a service to benefit everybody, to keep everybody safe and keep the environment 
sustainable over the long term. So, that said, one of the things that we've developed here at the University of Texas at Austin is such a thing. It is the world's first crowdsourced space traffic monitoring system called Astrograph, and it's automated. And what we do now is we bring in multiple sources of information from not just the US, but from international partners, and represent that in a common operating picture, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what this thing does here in a little bit, that anybody across the planet can access, okay? Very quickly, here we, here we have, so all of those objects are a combination of opinions about what's on orbit from different sources. This is, uh, we have the US Department of Defense, their opinions, we have the Russian JSC Vimple catalog, which you kind of see there, which I'm going to click off of that. We have the Russians' opinions. We have opinions from Planet Labs. They have CubeSats. And we have opinions from Leo Labs, commercial radar. So we have multiple opinions, all represented kind of in the same framework. Now, one problem that we have in space is that as five different people, their opinions about what's going on in space, where are things going to go in the future, and you're likely to get 10 different answers. The opinions themselves are inconsistent. So let me show you. So this is, this is real stuff that we get. Okay, that's all the combined opinions. If you wanted to see the opinion of just the US Department of Defense, so let's click on that, what does that space traffic map look like? That's what that looks like. Wow, I just saw a bunch of dots disappear. You did. Now, if I ask the Russians what their public opinion is, that looks significantly different. Who do you trust? Who do you believe? Which one's more accurate? Can anybody here in the room tell me, how do you know when you have the world's most accurate clock? How do you know that you have the world's most accurate clock? Anybody? What? So here's the thing. If you have only one, then you don't know for sure, right? You have to assume that that's right. If you have two, well, if they don't say the same thing, which one's right? Currently, on planet Earth, the way you tell time is there are hundreds of atomic clocks distributed across the globe. Each one gives its opinion of the time, and you find the very center of that to figure out what the actual time is, and you know how accurate your clock is by comparing all these things to each other. That is the power of crowdsourcing this stuff for space is that there's going to be multiple opinions, but we want to find out the truth through consistency. Inconsistency is not horrible. It's telling you, guess what? You got work to do, man. That's okay. So, what I'm going to show you is, I'm going to give you now an example of what I'm talking about, about a single opinion, and how single opinions... Here we go. So I'm going to, I'm going to look up the satellite. It's going to be Flock 1C10 which currently belongs to Planet Labs, okay? There's the Earth, there's Flock 1C10, and it turns out that this single satellite owned by Planet Labs, there are multiple opinions. Number one is where the US Department of Defense publicly believes or says that this satellite is located. Number two is where the owner says it's located. Number three, I see, you can, you can see where I'm going here. Number three is where a commercial radar operator, Leo Labs, believes it's located. And number four is where me and my grad students say it's located based on this commercial radar data. All right, four opinions, right? Now, I'm going to try to zoom in here. So you see one, the DOD's opinion, somewhere there coming into the Hudson Bay. You see four, which is clearly within the Arctic Circle. Those things aren't very close to each other, are they? Same object, okay? So let's zoom in here. Let's zoom in and see, see what's going on. Let me try to see if I can zoom in here. All right. Wow, number one is there. There's number four. I'm going to, these things are moving. We have simple dynamics propagating these things, so I'm going to pause it just to make my job a little bit easier. And uh, I'm working with a borrowed laptop, so forgive me. Let me see if I can make this work here, okay? Ah, you just saw a number kind of change there. Okay, here we go. 
Yep, yep, it's coming, it's coming. The thing that I want you to, to notice, right, is that as I try to... Hmm, yeah, this is going to be a bit tricky. Um, as I try to bring this thing into view, um, number one was way off, right? You got number... Yeah, this is probably not going to work so well. Number one is way off. And let me just tell you that two, three, and four are pretty much on top of each other. Okay? So the thing is, it's one object, multiple opinions. How do you know which one is truth and, how, how, and, and which one isn't? And so that's part of the problem. In space situational awareness, what tends to happen is that multiple hypotheses tend to explain the same evidence. And that creates ambiguity. So that's all I want to say as an intro. Diane, take it away. Well, hello. First, I want to thank you all very much for inviting me to take part in this. This has been an eye-opening, mind-boggling experience for me the last day and a half. And, um, and I have to say, much of what I've heard a lot of you talk about, even though it comes from a very different discipline, relates to what I believe we're talking to you about right now. So more of us started out by saying, I am an astrodynamicist. I will start out by saying, hi, my name is Diane Howard, and I am a space lawyer. So I, I, I really enjoyed two panels back. There was a, a very robust discussion about the, the joys of transdisciplinary um, education and learning. And I, I believe uh, very strongly in this as a, a way forward for teaching our youth, but also for teaching ourselves, particularly since we are all in relatively uncharted territory, and isn't that what this is all about? This is about um, going forward in, in, in um, dealing with problem sets and new skill sets and, and trying to solve um, challenges that have yet been even bounded. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here. So I work on the soft science size, side of a lot of what Mar Mariba was talking about. I've been calling you Mariba for years, and I heard, just heard him. So, so I've, just, I've just learned it yet another thing. <laughs> Um, so what does, does a space lawyer actually have to do with any of what we're talking about? So Moriba was talking about the space situational awareness side of things, or the monitoring, and the fact that this relates to a lot of what you all were talking about, and that is data, and then what we do with that data. Well, you know, the first we, we, take it in from, we take it in as data points, and then we, we do stuff to it. It becomes perhaps information at that sweet spot, and then we have the analytics, and we, we make determinations. So you have all these different opinions, and, and then different satellites are performing different missions and those different missions have completely different tolerances for um, how close they can come, how much, uh, how much spectrum interference can they tolerate, what is going to um, be a, a deal breaker for those, those different missions. And, and I, you know, I've been thinking about what I'm going to say to you. Why would you care? So I would say that those of you that are here, um, I believe it's, it's a pretty hefty percentage of people that are here from the Army, you should definitely care. I know usually the Air Force is what we really talk about when we talk about what's going on with the catalog. But you all rely upon, you may not be you know, the providers of the information, but you certainly are the users of the information and the services. So that's why you all should care. But there's a lot of you also, I believe, that represent um, research thinkers, people here from, the, from here at UT, which certainly has a, a amazing research potential opportunities for students and also for faculty members, but I believe there's also people from industry. And so my invitation to you right now is to kind of put on your thinking cap as we talk to you about some of what we're dealing with, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on on the law slash policy side, because none of this is occurring by itself. We're working hard to cross-pollinate and to go across disciplines and make sure that the conversations that are going on at all levels, and, and I mean at the highest levels of the federal government, but also internationally, include these different perspectives. But we would like, you know, you, you, some of you are thinking about how to use sensors and take in this information and how to vet it and how to protect it and how to, how to make it something that we can trust and how to take that forward. So those are very similar situations to what we're dealing with right now. So the idea is that, um, as, as Marba was saying, we have an, an environment that is inherently international, so it's very different from the environment that the hypersonic uh, 
gentlemen were talking about in the panel right before us, but it's it, there. There's no no claims, no sovereignty. You have you know one country's assets next to another country's assets. You do have different parts, different orbits that are um, more uh, that are better for certain kinds of activities, but. There's, there are, although there are no traffic rules per se, and no real coordination norms as yet, there are some very broad principles that, that do govern. So there, there are liabilities that, that can be involved. There are certain duties to consult if you know you're going to interfere with somebody else's activities or, or you believe that they are going to with yours. But past that, we have very little. Um, and the trend in international law is not to lock down on binding treaties and, and things that, you know, prescribe. The trend is actually, here in the U.S., to not even put regulations in place that are really prohibitive and very prescriptive, but instead things that facilitate innovation and things that look for that sweet spot between oversight, which is required by those very broad treaties, and even even for DOD activities, but all governmental and non-governmental activities of a, of a state party in space have to be authorized and continually supervised. That's a treaty obligation. That that's um, it's not obscure. It's one that's really at the forefront of all space actors and, and their consciousness. So that 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 is very much present. Now, you notice that this the first source an astrograph came from STRATCOM. So it isn't that we don't have anything. One of these very um, robust and relied upon catalogs of information is provided by DOD and has been for a number of years. And the, the, I think the point that needs to be made is, one, it's not the only game in town. And two, as we go forward and we're utilizing space, not just for you, um, army people and, and also military people, but it impacts our lives on a daily basis, every one of us. I mean, I walked here from my hotel this morning and I used Google Map Woman to t tell me how to get here and, and I was relying on GPS, which is built into my phone. So that, that's a very immediate example and, and it's one that I'm sure that we can all relate to. And that, so we, we have impacts that, that um, are provided to us not just by the government, but we have applications that are also provided to us by industry. We also have social goods. I saw a really interesting presentation yesterday by somebody who was talking about UAV, I believe it was the DARPA gentleman, and he was talking about all the different things that some of these different uh, uh, unmanned systems could provide, and a lot of the things that they could provide were things that satellites can provide, but you know, take many steps back in a much more global context. So the idea is we have DOD providing a service that is less than sufficient, and we have many multiple users and many reasons for why we need to get better at what we're doing. We have a crowdsource platform, and we also have a mandate here in the U.S. because not only are there international things that have been going on for a number of years, which are still very high level and don't really deal, they don't drill down into the nuts and bolts on how to collect this information. But here in the US, we had a, a, a very well articulated policy that was um, well, actually two policies that are um, implicated um, with regard to SSA and STM. The first is the SPD2 that came out last February, and the second is SPD3, which came out in June, both in 2018. The first one said that the U.S. recognizes that SSA and STM are really critical to um, the benefits that we all um, enjoy and rely upon from space, and that in order to continue to, um, to grow and to flourish from a leadership standpoint and from an economic standpoint, from a national security standpoint, certainly, that there needed to be... Um, some work done on it needed to be handed off to a civil a civil agency in the government so not DOD there are definitely benefits to bifurcating this uh, information provision okay? let DOD do what DOD does best protect protect okay let them 
focus their intentions on, on the reason they began keeping the catalog. And because this is an inherently an international domain or international area, um, it, and because ultimately the best traffic coordination or orbital coordination efforts are going to involve international stakeholders, not just domestic. There, are, there is an optics benefit to taking it from defense and putting it into a civil agency because it's a little more palatable to some of our international partners. And so SPD2 said, Department of Commerce, you, you should start working on this, but didn't get into much more. There was a whole lot of other things that were uh, much more uh, articulated in SPD2. But SPD3 was the first time that it, a, 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 a national government put together a space traffic management policy, and it's amazing. So it's, uh, it's actually uh, <laughs> a work of art, um, and it involves, it, it sets out tasks for multiple agencies, NASA, DOD, Commerce, Transportation, mentions the FCC. It says all of you need to be working in a whole of government approach and dealing with interagency to start to really come up with ways that we can make this better, okay? And Commerce, you're gonna take the lead with regard to figuring out a way to put together a, an open architecture. And I, I posit to you that this is a very good first start right here. An open architecture that allows a repository of data. And then uh, you should take, there are some very specific goals and objectives that are laid out in SPD3. And Commerce, in rallying to this mandate to step up and, and start working on things, on April 11th, published in the Federal Register its first request for information, asking for academia and industry inputs with regard to these set, the, this set of issues and questions and challenges. And I'm gonna invite you all to take a look at that if you have time and bandwidth because I believe after what I've heard in the last day and a half that some of you are already thinking about these kinds of situations like how do, you, how do we vet the information as it comes in? How do we collect it? How do we make it operable across formats? I heard a very interesting uh, statement, I, I think in the hypersonic, one, one of the AI discussions about the fact that it isn't completely plug and play. You don't take it necessarily out of one context and just drop it down in another. And yet, I'm sure that there are some things that are um, somewhat similar. So another wonderful phrase I heard uh, from, from one of the panels was this, this idea of values and wants. And that's pretty much what the RFI is putting, putting forward. And, and asking for inputs. What are your values and what are your, want, your wants? Those of you that rely upon the space applications and those of you that are providing those services, those of you that are operators, those of you that are um, monitors, those of you that are um, collecting the data, those of you that are providing analytics. Because right now, that's where we're at um, from a from a, a legal and policy standpoint, I would say that we're really way premature to coming up with regulations, but we're in the hunting and gathering stage. And so that's what this RFI is, that um, you, you know, until May 11th, we're hunting and gathering information to come into the US government, so that that can be then synthesized and collated, and it, it will be the beginnings of the rulemaking, because ultimately what we need and what SPD3 um, said this is you know you, you should end up with some standards and some those standards should flow from practices the best of the practices and safety and sustainability of this environment this very contested and, and somewhat congested environment should be the drivers to what of those practices are considered the best and then there is a process to taking practices and actually um, making them into standards that can be incorporated by reference into rules and then we have some oversight and the beginning of the traffic rules or the coordination rules that that we so sorely need so thank you for your time excellent so before uh, before I before I open this up to uh, discussion, which is really what we want, I want to just plug in a couple more ideas for you. 
thing number one is you saw this graph of like 26,000 objects, right? Um, guess, guess how many licenses the FCC is, has granted for things to be launched within the next, say, five years? Can anybody guess like how many objects just from the US? So I hear 6,000, going on 6,000 ones, going on 6,000. So it's, 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 it's about 10,000. So Elon Musk, already has licenses to launch 7,500 objects in the next five years. Amazon, just a couple of weeks ago, said that they want to launch 3,300 objects. OneWeb already launched a dozen out of about 1,000 objects that they want to have. So that 26,000 is about to be doubled in the next five years if all these people actually launch this stuff. But I'm just talking about the U.S., China wants to launch satellites. Russia wants to launch satellites. Everybody wants to launch satellites. So it's the new gold rush. I'm telling you, there's a lot of money to be made by having things on orbit and connecting that to human-based activity and all these things. On tap. Information on tap. That's what we want. We want to be able to know and be able to predict who's going to be at the shopping mall in one hour and who's moving this ship to, you know, there's all this wealth of information and knowledge and none of it can really be had if you don't have any sort of space-based capability and people are rushing to just launch as much stuff as possible as quickly as possible. Let me tell you something else. All of this stuff is based on physics. Physics is not the only thing responsible for how these things behave. All the satellites that are actually working are operated by human beings. If you want to understand, so people are saying, well, we want to understand what normal behavior is in space. I hear that all the time, and we're going to discuss that, and Diane's heard a lot, of, you know, a lot about that as well. What does that mean, normal behavior in space? We, in this room, we can accept that based on where we grew up, we had some certain customs and traditions, and these are not uniform across humanity, right? Why do we expect the same for space? Any time there is a behavior that we don't understand, it's panic mode. It's questioning. What's the intent of this object? Wow, this, this satellite from, from, from Kenya that was built the Chinese all of a sudden kind of snuggled up next to me. Well, is it because the Kenyan satellite that has some relationship with China really wants to snuggle up next to you? Or maybe they are trying to do the best that they can, joysticking this thing around, and they don't have the resources to do orbit determination to one meter. If you want to understand American culture in space, anybody guess when American satellites tend to maneuver on orbit? Anybody in this room? Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Why? I don't want to do a maneuver on Friday. Murphy's Law, something goes wrong. I don't want to get home late. I definitely don't want to come in on weekends and holidays and for sure, after a weekend of chilling out, I don't want to come into work and then have to do this maneuver, this really important thing. So Americans maneuver their satellites on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or Thursdays. But that's American culture. And we love doing optimal stuff. It's all about optimal and optimization. We are the optimizers. That's what Americans like to do, optimal. So anytime there's a maneuver that's not optimal, Oh, wow, these people from, you know, Amberland, they maneuvered their satellite in a very inefficient way. That's a red flag. Maybe not. So what I'm telling you is that this, to date, is absent cultural context. And that's no good. So all you folks out there that are physicists, hard scientists, and kind of like, oh, these social science people, like, why do we need them? Because we can't predict how everything's going to behave unless we understand humanity and cultural competency in helping explain these behaviors. And so I need a computational behavioral scientist. I need a computational so social scientist. I need a computational lawyer. I need to bring in these soft sciences to help explain a lot of this behavior and help me predict because space can only be safe and sustainable if it can be transparent and predictable. 
And if I can't make space transparent and predictable, we don't get there, folks. So that is part of the innovation that you need to think about, is how do you fuse information that comes from physics and from human-based inputs to provide the right context to help explain everything that we observe and help predict what other people are going to do. So with that, do you want to say anything else? No, I, I think we should open this up because I think it would be wonderful if you have some, co some questions for us. Okay, um, as, as, as we get fired up for a question, we'll I, I have a, I, I'll, I'll kick it off for you. Okay. So transparent, predictable. Few people could have predicted on 27 March the Indians were going to do an anti-satellite attack. Open source says about 100 fragments when they took out one of their own uh, satellites. What, I, I don't want to take away because we're going to have a, after lunch we're going to explore this in a war game that both of you are going to be involved in with some students uh, from your programs. But help us understand these are devices. Are, are these things we're seeing up here, is this also debris as yes. well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so all, all of this, this is everything that's currently trackable that I can gather from as many different sources as possible. So it also includes the fragments of the Indian ASAP. So from that one piece, you went to 100 immediately. Yeah. More. 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 Yeah. And uh, so help us understand what, it, what is the, before, like without stealing the next group, yeah, yeah. what is the potential of something like that actually creating a situation where we would have a degraded space environment or just an accident, the great space environment that it could affect Diane's ability to walk here and use her GPS. So, 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 he, so here's the thing, right? So fragments from what the Indians did won't go as high as GPS, so, so we can rule that out. But some fragments did go as high and are as high as the International Space Station. And so that's a hazard to human spaceflight and that resource, right? And we can't possibly accurately predict when these collisions might happen, and that's part of it, is because there's ambiguity. We don't have ubiquitous observations on everything all the time with the most accurate sensors all the time, and so a lot of it is just a guess. And like I said, we can only track down to a certain size. Fragments that are below that size are just random bullets. Let me add to that. So one of the issues with regard to the Indian ASAT is that it's actually um, the way that the treaties are set up right now, it, there's not a prohibition against that kind of a test. There are prohibitions about um, creating things that, that could harmfully interfere with other space activities, and that's, that's in the Outer Space Treaty, but that's a little bit more obscure. And this is certainly not the first time that we've had debris-creating ASATs. We had one in 2007 by the Chinese, then of course the U.S. showed them how to do it in 2008, much lower, and we had the hydrazine situation, and it didn't create a whole lot of debris, so it can be done. And here you had the Indians who were really actually trying to do it more like the U.S. had done it in 2008 than like the Chinese had done it in 2007, and yet even with that, that intention. So what can we do? We don't have this absolute prohibition. We have space debris mitigation guidelines, which are obsolete and antiquated. We have efforts going on internationally and also domestically to try to recalibrate what those end of mission requirements should be with regard to debris and, and, and what do you do? And that, that's the issue. So there are um, initiatives that are going on at the international level right now, uh, at, the, uh, at UNIDIR, and um, working on norms that would um, create maybe not an absolute prohibition, but enough name and shame in the international community if you perform a test and that, Tibet, that test provide, uh, produces debris. So, so there, are, there are things that we're trying to do about that because the impacts, we, cannot, we can't foresee them. They, they are there, and they're there for a long, long time, much of the time. So I hope that answered your question. Any, any other questions? Right here, sir. Very interesting talk. Um, your data set seems like an exemplar example to apply multi-entity correlation um, disambiguation and uh, aggregation algorithms. Have you applied any? So yet? the answer is we have not applied them yet. Right now we're in a information gathering and curation phase, uh, but the analytics that you speak of is exactly the direction that, that we want to go in. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Spot on. Tickety-boo. Tickety-boo. One of the great governing features of all of this is spectrum. 
And there are some very specific rules with regard to spectrum. And there are some very specific rules well beyond what the FCC has, including the International Telecommunications Union, Union and the WARC. So <clears throat> while we want to put up spacecraft like candy bars, there's going to be some winners and losers. And, and, and there's also going to be a, a very rich business for you with regard to uh, jamming and interference in space that's going to result in a lot of uh, legal liabilities. You're, yes, and, and in the RFI that I mentioned before, um, Spectrum is mentioned. Um, the FCC recently came out with its own rulemaking trying to address some of these issues and, and, and plug them into um, the ITU. Um, which that's, that's, that's a very detailed amount of regulations. However, even that is being completely revamped and, and recalibrated as we kind of um, take unused spectrum and, and try to get more efficient about it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of issues about whether or not we can auction it off, not, um, you know, compatible users being near each other. And, and certainly, you know, the, 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 we, we haven't really agreed on the best definition of what SSA and STM are. But one of the definitions that has been around since 2006 does also mention the, the fact that it's not just physical interference, it's also spectrum interference as well. So yeah, th those are all really good points. There's a gentleman over here. Uh, what were some of the sources of ambiguity for the, the flock system that you had uh, compared with the different situational tools? Yeah, so um, for the flock itself, Planet Lab is very forward leaning and they provide us with information on the location of each satellite based on onboard GPS. So we know that location to within tens of meters, so that's good, and we use that as a reference. And so when we compare everybody else, we compare it to that, right? And so some of the sources of error are the sensors that are used, like, you know, Leo Labs, they give us radar data that they collect on all the planet satellites. They have their own orbit determination tools, but they, they don't lie, their answer doesn't line up exactly with planets because they have assumptions in the underlying physics, and the sensors are corrupted with noise and are biased. By the way, folks, the truth about all sensors is that all sensors lie. So embrace that fact and, and life gets easier from there. So, so the thing is, all sensors lie. There's no truth sensor out there. So that also contributes to the discrepancy. Um, and my answer, uh, even though I process the same data that Leo Labs does, my answer is different because I have different assumptions in the underlying physics and all that other stuff, right, in the math, and the estimation algorithm that I actually use. So this is to tell everybody we have work to do. Even if you give everybody the same data set, the answers are going to differ because of these things that I just mentioned, which motivates standardization and coming to an agreement on fundamental assumptions when we do this sort of work, right? So that's the work that still kind of lies ahead of us. But that is the, those are the sources of these inconsistencies, my friend. Have you tried a product called Stop, uh, Stop Bot, S-T-A-T-B-O-T? It's a free software and it runs very fast deployment which you'll be able to analyze all the data. SQL analyst. Uh, uh, oh, it works on SQL? Yeah. Well, um, so you can, I ha you can generate all kind of the reports, okay. all that statistics. It's called StatBot. So if, if offline, if we could talk about it, yep. I'd love to, to use it. I, I don't say no to these things. Yeah. So, yeah. Any more questions? Come on, come on. What's the worst case scenario in your mind? Wow. Um, maybe this sets, so I think one of the worst case scenarios may be what we'll probably engage in after lunch, to be honest with you, right? Which I won't steal a thunder out of that, but um, like I said, part of the, the thing that makes space situational awareness difficult is that more often than not, 
multiple hypotheses that can be very different from each other explain the same evidence. So we don't have the amount and the type of evidence usually to whittle all that down to one-to-one -one causal relationships. That's where we want to get to, but we're not there or anywhere close. And so that, to me, is the worst case scenario, is something happening where you have all these different explanations that satisfy the evidence, and how do you know which one of those multiple things was the culprit, was the cause of, what, of the consequence that, that, that you observed? Sir. Okay, Frank again, there you go. If I want to be a very, very bad person and at low Earth orbit, uh, could I put up a pair of debris fields on the north and south pole and interrupt a large volume of almost all traffic that would be going around the planet? So the debris fields wouldn't just stay there. They would, like, they would move all around the planet because of you know, curvature of space time and, and, and physics. Speed, so yeah, yeah, yeah. To get a trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll get a trail. So what I'm saying is that any debris event that you put in LEO uh, that has high inclination, which would go through the poles, so, so sun synchronous, for instance, would be, if you could create a huge debris field in sun synchronous, and then that would pose hazards to everything that, you know, crisscrosses uh, uh, in that environment. And let's see, yeah, the Chinese did that in 2007. We, we have a number of folks that are, uh, that are drinking a lot of Leo Kool-Aid uh, in OSD to a point where it's the only orbit that matters. I find that as being anti-resilient by putting all your eggs into a low Earth orbit basket. Understood. So, so one thing that I want to say before I hand it off to Diane is that um, here's the thing. When you want to achieve a specific mission, you want to use Mother Nature as much as possible, right? Because that, that keeps the cost down. LEO isn't just chosen just because it happens to be closer. It ha it's chosen because, based on perturbations, it makes, makes using Mother Nature the best possible so that we don't have to spend so much money with propellant, these other things. If you have to achieve the same mission and fight things like gravity, that's an expensive proposition, and that makes the calculus look a lot uglier. But I agree that there, there needs to be an all-hands-on-deck hybrid solution that can explore other orbital regimes to provide that level of resilience like you said. I, I just want to um, chime in and say, I, I think you have support up the chain. So Secretary Wilson made that very point at symposium in Colorado Springs the week, after, the week before last and, and, and said we can't put all of our eggs or all of our satellites in any one orbit, but instead true resilience says that we, are, we rely on more than just the one. I think we're going to uh, halt here and then continue the conversation uh, after lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, okay. I've been waiting for this. By the way, SSA is more than what it spells backwards. I just want everyone to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, I see. I was calling you Moriba, okay, so more of us. I mean, I know more of us. Yeah. Now there I know more of us. There you more go. Of a. There you go. You. These are your proclamations Ooh. as Army mad scientists. Thank right. you. As well as the, uh, the coin with the brain on a chip. And I think I'm the first space lawyer. Oh, I guarantee you are. <laughs> I didn't know we even had any of those. Wow. Ah. I'm glad beautiful. we do now. And then for your, for your offices. Thank, thank you. you. There you go. I'm going to steal this from you. Yeah. you thank you very that. much. Thank you for the water. Yes. So, so. Diane and Morba are going to be up here after lunch because we're doing a first ever in Mad Scientist. You're actually going to watch an ongoing war game. We're taking these two individuals, Matt Bold from Lockheed, and three students from their program that they've selected uh, to come up here, and they're going to lay out a scenario at low Earth orbit, and they're going to brainstorm the idea, and we're, going to, and we're going to observe that and get to ask them questions to drive them through it. I'll explain more, but we've never done it before. And that's what Mad Science is about, trying to look for different ways to explore ideas. And it's going to be a great diverse panel with everything, with all kinds of people involved in it. So it's going to be a great opportunity. So right now, um, it's a little afternoon. You're going to come back at 1.15 today. Now let me give you, a little, let me give you some guidance uh, on that. 
Uh, the agenda says 1.30, come back at 1.15 because I'm working to get you out 15 minutes early today. So, so work with me. Uh, your lunch...